Let me preface this presentation with a bit of a personal story. I'm an athlete, and I considered myself pretty knowledgeable when it came to my fitness. You see, I'd spent hours um, preparing for weekend tournaments, moving from one side of the tennis court to the other, taking my exhaustion at the end of practice and my soreness the following day as a positive sign that I was making forward progress. Now, while this regimen certainly had its benefits when it came to my strength and stamina at the tail end of three hour long matches, it did bring with it some misconceptions. You see, I equated being fit with how hard you worked, how much effort you put in, how much pain you went through. But as it turns out, the age old questions surrounding fitness were far more nuanced than I'd perceived them to be. A couple of summers back, I attended a STEM summer camp where a few friends and I took on a research project in the field of exercise science. Now over the course of a month, I watched on in equal parts shock and wonder as every preconception and pseudoscientific strategy I had regarding exercise simply melted away. In its place came data and sound hypotheses collected by premier exercise physiologists over decades of work. My team and I focused heavily on how to make exercise better for your average non-athlete. So we decided to focus our efforts on a very specific type of exercise, what you see in this picture, steady state cardio. Now admittedly, jogging might not be the flashiest workout routine, but it can be useful for achieving your fat burning and health improvement goals, especially if the intensity at which you exercise is optimized. Now, when I'm talking about exercise intensity, I simply mean how hard you're working out. By manipulating this critical variable, you can entirely shift the benefits of your workout from muscle toning to improved aerobic capacity to, as I just mentioned, burning fat. Now, fat burn was a key driver in our study, and we decided to look into an intensity that pertained specifically to it, an exercise intensity known as fat max. Now, despite having a name that appears straight out of the supplements aisle at GNC, this often elusive point has made its way into exercise science papers dating back over 30 years. Fat max is the exercise intensity at which you achieve maximal fat oxidation. In other words, it's the intensity where you, or me, or your grandparents burn the most fat. Now, through a series of interventional studies, fat max has been found to both um, lower your body weight and fat mass, all while improving your cardiovascular health and fitness. So knowing all of this, you'd expect fat max to be something fairly easy to measure, or at least something fairly known, right? Unfortunately, due to variables such as sex, training level, BMI, diet, finding a unifying fat max for the entire population has proven to be difficult, especially in understudied populations such as adolescents. Studying adolescents is of critical importance given the increasing hold obesity is having on younger and younger populations. Adolescent obesity is associated with various comorbidities later on in life, including but not limited to cardiovascular disease, stroke, and type 2 diabetes. But recent studies have found that such ailments can occur as early as adolescence itself. So with this rather grim backdrop, my team and I decided to get to work in answering the following question. Where does fat max occur in adolescent boys and girls? Now to understand this concept a little bit further, a, a, few, um, a brief background on the human metabolism is necessary. Now the human body's main sources of energy are carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. But for our purposes, the contribution of protein to our energy can be considered negligible. Lipolysis, the burning of fat for energy, requires oxygen, while glycolysis, the burning of carbs for energy, does not require oxygen. Now, why does this matter when it comes to fat max, you might be asking? Well, as it turns out, there are a couple of terms such as aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. You might have heard of them. Aerobic metabolism is the creation of energy in the presence of oxygen, and the anaerobic metabolism is the creation of energy in the absence of oxygen. Low to moderate exercise intensities typically occur within a person's aerobic metabolism. 
That is, there is plenty of oxygen available for them to breathe in, which is evidenced by the fact that when you're not working out that hard, you don't need to, um, or you're not breathing particularly hard either. On the other hand, higher exercise intensities are almost exclusively within a person's anaerobic metabolism, which again, there's not a lot of oxygen going to your uh, muscles and organs, and as a result, you feel very winded and you can't sustain anaerobic warmth for a really long time. So without oxygen present, fat simply cannot be burned. So contrary to popular belief, you don't burn the most fat when you work out the hardest. In fact, studies into adults have found that fat max occurs at low to moderate exercise intensities, well within the aerobic metabolism where fats are the primary source of energy. As you can see in this um, slide over here, the fat max is occurring at about moderate exercise intensity for this particular person. So let's bring things back to our study. In the picture over here, you'll see a fairly standard setup for a graded exercise test. Up front over here is my friend on the ergometer, and all the way in the back, that's me. Now, the way the test function was pretty much we started biking on the cycle ergometer, and every minute the intensity or the resistance was increased until we simply couldn't continue any longer. Now, that mask that you see attached to my friends in my face, which reminds me of um, Bane from The Dark Knight, hooks up to a machine that analyzes how much oxygen you're inhaling and carbon dioxide you're exhaling. Using these two values, the amount of fat you're burning and the amount of carbs you're burning at a given time is calculated. So from your air, they can calculate exactly what our substrate utilization is. That's pretty neat. Now, underneath our shirts, you won't see it, but um, there's a heart rate monitor that was simultaneously feeding d data to a computer as this fat and carbs data was coming in. We measured the maximal fat oxidation as the highest 30 second average of fat burn. Now, we also had the heart rate data at the same point. So using these two pieces of data, we calculated the fat max as the percentage of peak heart rate at which fat max occurs. The reason we chose a percentage of peak heart rate was to determine through pretty simple math whether um, exercising or whether fat max occurred at low, moderate, or high exercise intensities. So let me recap that real quick. It was a bit technical. We had the machine that analyzed the air we breathed in and out and could tell us when we were burning the most fat. We also had the heart rate monitors that measured our exercise intensity at a given point. We just meshed the two streams of data together and we got our fat max value. At this point, it's important for me to introduce you all to our main hypothesis. We hypothesized that in both adolescent boys and girls, there would be a strong correlation between fat max and the aerobic threshold. Wait, what is an aerobic threshold? Well, a little while back, I was speaking about the aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. The aerobic threshold is simply the point where the anaerobic metabolism begins to take over from the aerobic. In practical terms, you're at a comfortable point in your exercise. Your breath is certainly elevated, but other than that, you're just a step above a walk in the park, both literally and figuratively. Now, virtually every study in adults have found that the aerobic threshold is highly correlated to the fat max, and we wanted to see whether the same applied to our sample population adolescence. Now this is all very technical, so let me zoom out for a second. Finding the correlation between the aerobic threshold and fat max doesn't mean particularly much if you don't have access to the ergometers or the treadmills that we used in the lab, but it's certainly a start in finding this critical point. In fact, the reason we chose heart rate as a measure in our study was to improve the practicality and applicability of the data we captured. Raise your hand here if you have a Fitbit or a Garmin or Apple Watch or some other kind of fitness tracker. All right, we got quite a few hands here, wow. And I didn't plan anyone in the audience either. So with the advent of wearable tech with built-in heart rate monitors, you're never more than a few clicks away from determining whether you're exercising at the correct intensity or not. Now, in adults, this intensity, fat max intensity, has been found to occur between 50 and 70% of your peak heart rate, or for your average 40-year-old, between 90 and 126 beats per minute. 
Now, several variables determine whether you're on the higher or lower end of that range, and the only true way to figure out what your heart rate is at fat max is to get an exercise test. But chances are, you will be optimizing your fat burn somewhere in that range as an adult um, if you exercise at that intensity. Now with adolescents, there's still a lot we don't know. But by measuring fat max relative to peak heart rate, the hope is with simple multiplication, kids like me can determine exactly which heart rate we should be at in order to burn the most fat. So it's now time to see the results of our study. The preliminary results show a high correlation and determination between the heart rates at the aerobic threshold and fat max. Now the reason I include the term determination is because as it happened, the correlation between the two variables was so strong that the, that the aerobic threshold was found to be identical to the fat max in adolescents. What this means is if you exercise at the aerobic threshold and you're an adolescent, you're also killing two birds with one stone and you're exercising at fat max. Now relative to peak heart rate, Adolescents were, or adolescent girls were found to um, achieve fat max higher than boys, with um, both achieving it in about the 60% peak heart rate range. Now the reason girls were higher than boys in terms of this intensity came down to a couple of things. One being that girls, due to their smaller hearts, typically experience higher heart rates at the same exercise intensity. And also, girls, due to their more efficient aerobic metabolism, are able to burn fat much better and much more efficient than boys can. So let's talk key takeaways. Fat max is the exercise intensity at which you burn the most fat, period. In both adolescents and adults, fat max doesn't require some crazy exercise intensity. In fact, just exercise or just jogging for um, 30 minutes to an hour or biking for that same time period is all it takes to achieve and stay at this point. In adolescence, through our study, we found that the aerobic threshold and fat max occur at the same point. So exercising at one yields the other. Now relative to peak heart rate, or actually just talking about heart rate values, they both overlap for adolescents and adults. Regardless of age, you're likely to achieve your fat max between 100 and 125 beats per minute. But in adolescents, that range will, um, or in adolescent girls, that'll be on the higher end of that range compared to boys for the reasons I explained earlier. Now, while several more studies need to be conducted in order to determine a consensus in the population, the impact of this body of studies on the overall um, physical health of middle and high school age students cannot be understated. In younger students, unstructured playtime, a concept deemed critical to both the physical and mental development of students, can be centered around achieving fat max. In our personal lives, soon we may not even need access to such fancy equipment in order to determine our fat max. We might need to just input some variables such as sex, BMI, and training level, and we can have a personalized exercise plan for our body and our needs. You see, my hope for kids my age is that one day we can do away with the discouragement of ineffective exercise, uh, um, I guess the lack of results, and the one-size-fits-all training regimen, and move towards achieving our health goals in a way that's tailor-made for us and meaningful to us. I'd like to take a second to uh, thank my research partners, Alex and Shrieker, our um, grad students, Juan, Serena, and Nick, and my, our professor and mentor, Dr. Marco Meucci. Without you all, this research and much less this presentation would not have been possible. Thank you all, and I hope you all now have one less excuse to get out there and get some exercise.